Hey, Odie's on Finance Community. This is Dr. Aaron Neufeld, co-founder and host of the video and podcast series. Today's video and podcast is going to be with CPA David Glenn. He's answering questions that we got about taxes. If you're interested in working with David on your taxes, his phone number is 808-321-5664, and his email address is david at glennadvisory.com. Check out the website or the forum. He is a sponsor, so his information is on there as well. Enjoy the program. All right, cool. We're going to go ahead and get started. So first thing, just want to thank everyone for being an awesome part of this group. Uh, it's grown to about 6,800 on the Facebook group. So we really appreciate all the conversation that you guys have put in, all the questions, all the feedback, everything. And remember to invite all your friends that are either ODs or students to the group. And we've got a lot of good resources. So definitely bring them all in. And next thing, uh, definitely check out our new refi page. Uh, DAT just updated all the lenders on there. So everything is completely updated. So take a look. Uh, I think we got about 10 partners that were uh, with lenders. So yeah, definitely take a look at that. Click on the links and see what you can get if you're looking to refi your student loans. And to all of you that bought the book, about 200 of you, thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate that. It's been number six on business and finance on Amazon, which uh, we were really surprised to see uh, for the past two weeks. So super excited about that. And once again, a portion of the book proceeds are going to go to Vosh, and we're looking forward to writing them a big check at the end of the year. Also, we're using another portion of those book proceeds to create a scholarship fund. So we're, that's in the early works, and we'll keep you updated on that as well. And Definitely sign up for the newsletter. Just go on the website. A pop-up will direct you to the newsletter. There's also a newsletter section on the website as well. So do that. And our last thing, last order of business, uh, articles. We've got a lot of new material on the website. Our guest today actually wrote a really good article. And we also have another few from Julie Fan on real estate. Also, our mortgage sponsor has written a really good article on the physician's mortgage. And I've written a couple on private practice. And then DAT is going to be releasing one soon on retirement. So definitely stay tuned for that. Take a look at the website. It gets updated pretty much every other day. And that's all going to be in the newsletter coming out tomorrow for you guys that are signed up for that. All right. So yeah, without further ado... Let's go ahead and get the program started. So today we have David Glenn. He is a CPA located in Hawaii. Uh, he's a doctor-focused CPA. And what's awesome about him is he's all about doctors. So David, just tell me a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your practice, uh, your education experience, and all of that. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me on here. Um, yeah. So like you said, I'm a, a doctor-focused CPA. So my Current practice, I only accept uh, clients who are doctors, so that could be optometrists, dentists, uh, MDs, DOs, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and so that's my focus. I found that by focusing on that group, I'm able to provide a really high level of service and planning uh, that I think most CPAs um, kind of miss out on because they're not focused uh, on that. Um, so I, like you said, I live in Hawaii. I, uh, my wife's a professor out here, so that's what got us out here. And that's why it's, it's still daytime for me. Yeah. And, uh, and so I have, I guess I'm a CPA, I have a master's in taxation, and uh, I did two years as an IRS agent right out of school. So I'm glad to have that time behind me, but it was a good experience to do that. So Yeah, you know, the ins and outs of yeah. <laughs> the tax world, yeah. Cool. Well, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's get started. So we have quite a few questions from members, so I'm just going <laughs> to rattle through those. And the first question, which uh, you actually wrote an article kind of similar to this, uh, this was from one of our anonymous members. They asked, what is best, an S-Corp, a C-Corp, or an LLC for a practice owner? So if you can just kind of give an overview of each of those and the pros and cons and why would you choose one or the other? Okay. Yeah, so um, like you said, I wrote a, a post that goes into pretty good detail on this. So I'll just kind of give a, a highlight of that. Um, the first distinction I want to make in the question is that there's the legal entities, which are LLCs, limited liability companies, uh, partnerships, and corporations. And then there's sets of tax rules. There's C corporation, S corporation, uh, partnership, and sole proprietor. And so, um, depending on which entity you have and how many owners there are, you could have a variety of set of tax rules applying to your entity. The most um, 
common thing I see is that you can have an LLC. Those are really easy to form, but you, that could be potentially taxed as a sole proprietor, um, a C corporation, an S corporation, or a partnership, depending on the number of owners and what elections have been made. So I think I think the real crux of the question that's being asked is which set of tax rules should apply to my entity, uh, which one is best, and then that would then mm -hmm. decide what legal entity you form depending on the number of owners you have. And like I know, like in California, like I've heard that like uh, doctors can't have LLCs. There's no such thing as a yeah, deal. Yeah, that's true. But if you wanted to be an S corp, you'd have to use a corporation then make an S election. So the uh, the deciding factor between each one uh, depends on a couple things, like how much income you're earning, um, and like the state here in like California charges um, S corporation level tax, but they don't charge uh, taxes to sole proprietors unless they're using an LLC. So the um, uh, kind of go back a little bit. Um, the risk, so what it really comes down to what I see most common is people deciding between be taxed as a sole proprietor or an S corporation. Um, C corporation is usually not a good idea because you can you end up having uh, double taxation where the corporation pays tax mm -hmm. and then when you pay the earnings out as dividends then you're taxed again and usually the the total of those two rates ends up being pretty high. And so I usually only recommend C corporations if you want to get like like our startup when you want to raise money and have lots of investors. So usually my analysis fits center around sole proprietor or S corporation. And the what I look at there is um, how much income is being earned and what the um, what like a reasonable salary is for the work you're doing. Because in, in an S corporation, um, all the income that the company earns passes through to you and you're, you mm -hmm. pay taxes. So like if you run your profit loss for the year and it says 100,000, you're going to pay taxes on $100,000. Um, and it's the same thing in a sole proprietor. If your profit and loss is $100,000, you're going to pay taxes on $100,000. The difference is that as a sole proprietor, you're paying self-employment tax on all $100,000 of that profit. In an S corporation, you don't pay payroll taxes or employment taxes on the $100,000. But there's a catch. You have to pay yourself out of the profits. You have to pay yourself some of that as a salary. Right. And that salary is subject to payroll taxes. And so you can end up with a situation where you earn 100000 and you pay 50000 out of salary, and then the rest flows through as, um, as income. So you can save payroll taxes on that $50,000. And so that's the mechanics of how an S Corp saves you money. And so, um, but there's a couple other factors on how, like, some other deductions are affected, like the qualified business income deduction. You actually get less of it being an S corporation than you do if you're a sole proprietor. And so um, it's not really like an easy answer to say, I always in this case, do this one or that one. You just need to look at like total revenue. What's a reasonable salary? Is there a big enough difference between my, my total profit and then my, what my salary is to generate enough savings? Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that I have to run a scenario both ways to ultimately tell, is it, is it one or the other? Uh, it makes sense. Okay. So, yeah. And then we got a live question actually from Tuan Nguyen. Uh, she asked, can you explain if optometrists with one practice location can lease or buy a car under the business? Pros and cons to that. Yeah. So what I look for with vehicle expenses is I look to say like what what's like legitimate business use of the vehicle. And um, if it's not a business that lends itself to driving around a lot, like you mentioned, I think you're kind of hinting on that on the question that there's only one location. I think it... I think it would be hard to say that there's a high level of business use in that car if, if the business itself doesn't lend you, require the owner, the driver of that vehicle to drive around for, for business purposes. And uh, like if you have a home office and you drive to your office, that counts as a, as a business use. Um, but like having worked at the IRS, I know that in any audit of any business, if there's auto expenses on there, they're almost certainly going to look at that and look at it skeptically. And so, um, for me, my, my experience, there are areas where like it's okay to be a little more aggressive, but like my preference is to not be aggressive with auto expenses just because it's it's difficult to prove and unless the nature of the business lends itself to a lot of driving, I'm inclined mm -hmm. to just like if there is business driving, just use the standard mileage rate and not have a company on car and just reimburse the owner or, or claim it directly uh, as a business expense. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. All <clears throat> right, let's jump into the next one. Yeah, going off of that actually, uh, one of the questions from our members was, is what types of deductions are reasonable so just in general? Yeah, yeah so the, the tax code, it's section 162. It says 
uh, any ordinary and necessary business expense. And so that can be pretty broad. So anything that has a connection to your business that you're paying because you're operating your business can count as a business expense. Now to get more specific, there are um, some common ones that people might not think of. And so uh, we touched on a minute ago, like mileage, like, yeah. uh, and having a home office. So like if, if you do work at home and you have an area of your home that you use regularly and exclusively for work, you can count a portion of your home costs as a business expense. And so this, the facts have to support it. And then another benefit of having a home office is um, it makes it so that anytime you drive from your house to anything work related, that counts as, as business mile. And so you can count uh, the cost of that trip as a business expense. So some other ones are like cell phone costs, like a portion of your cell phone, if you use it at all for work. Um, again, that's facts specific, but um, uh, continuing education, basically anything you're having to pay for out of pocket that's related to your work is, is gonna be counting as a business expense. Okay. And oh, we got another live question here. Uh, this is from Amen to Bonnie. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. I currently have an LLC. Would I be able to show my W-2 as an income to the company? Oh, I'm I'm going to interpret that like you have an LLC here and then you get paid from another company as a W-2. So I'm the answer is no. You want, the W-2 income is going to be taxed to you directly, and you can't funnel that income through as LLC income because it's the LLC is not the employee. Uh, you are the employee. Okay. I think the live questions are still good. Okay. And then, yeah, so we touched on the deductions. Uh, and then another follow-up question that that same user had was a uh, personal use of office at home, company car, entertainment, gifts, and travel, if you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, the, uh, so the home office, um, like I said, so that's, you know, that, uh, the statute says it just needs to be an area of your home. It doesn't need to be a whole bedroom, but it needs to be an area of your home that you use regularly and exclusively. So like your kitchen table wouldn't count, but if you have, you know, a corner of, of a room that you use where you keep a desk and do work um, at night, and that's all you use that space for, then you can count that. And so the way you would do that is you, you would measure the square footage of the space compared to the square footage of your whole house. And that percentage is what you can deduct of your rent or your mortgage interest and property taxes and utilities and whatnot as a business expense. What were some of the other ones that they listed? And so company car, entertainment, gifts, and travel. Oh yeah, company car. So that's that's something that I personally don't like to do unless it's like really high business use, um, just, just from my own experience of uh, going through audits and whatnot. Uh, what are the other ones? And let's see here, uh, entertainment, gifts, uh, yeah. and travel. Okay. Yeah, so entertainment, uh, that could be like taking uh, clients or, or coworkers out for, for entertainment. And actually, there was a change in the tax law effector for 2018 that made all entertainment not deductible. It used to be 50% deductible, but now it's not deductible. So that would be like sporting events, trips, uh, like for people. Um, but meals are still 50% deductible. And a meal for it to be deductible, you either have to be out of town so like outside of your metropolitan area, mm -hmm. or um, there has to be a business purpose to the meal. So like you're eating with other people um, and it's, it's related to business that way. So that's the, that's the criteria for that. And how about gifts? Oh, Actually, yeah. A couple of people ask about gifts, you know, to staff members or gifts to. Yeah. So the rule for, for business gifts is the most you can deduct is, is $25 per person. Okay. Uh, like per gift. So. You got, they give out those twenty-five dollar gift cards. You can deduct all that, but if they're fifty-dollar gift cards, you deduct half of it. Okay. Uh, per gift card. Is there a limit to that, or is that just every time there is a gift? Or? I think it's per person per year. Per, okay. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty limited in that way. All right. Yeah, and then we got a follow-up question from our user that asked about the LLC and the W two. Uh, she said, "Thank you. So would I? So would I have to be a ten ninety nine to file under my LLC?" Yeah, so in order to show it as income of the LLC, the the 1099 or the, the payer paying that would have to be paying it to the LLC and then the 1099 issued to the LLC. And then from there, you'd have to figure out how you want the LLC to be taxed. Like if it's just you as the only owner, it's no different. It's not any different than not having an LLC. So you, if you wanted to do any file it any other way, you'd have to. Uh, have another owner and be taxed as a partnership or make an election with IRS to be taxed as a 
S corporation or a C corporation. But just yeah. having the LLC is the only one who doesn't do anything. All right. Here's another question about cars uh, from an anonymous member. Is it better to buy or lease for a company deduction and also a luxury car or a practical car? Ah, so I think with vehicles, do whatever is going to cost you like the least amount. Like, so the cost of a car is the, the depreciation on it, wear and tear, whatnot. Um, so it just comes back to whether like, like if you're using a car for business, you can have the company own it and pay for all the expenses or you have an ind the, not the company on it, and then the company reimburse that person for any business use of that car. And so if it's really high business use, uh, almost 100% or 100%, I prefer to have the company on it and the company just pay for all the expenses. If it's, if it's not 100% or close to 100%, I prefer to have the individual own it and then the company just reimburse the individual for the use of the car. That's gonna be like the most defensible way to claim the auto. Uh, expenses. That makes sense. And then a simple IRA versus regular IRA. How to choose? Okay, so it's not necessarily an either or. Like a, a simple mm. IRA is an employer-sponsored plan. So if you wanted a simple, you'd have to have an employer plan that that sponsors that, and then you're deferring money into the simple IRA. Um, and there's no income limits. Like like if you you can earn too much money and not be able to contribute to a regular IRA. I think for married people, it's like in the 100 to 121,000 or something like that of, of income. It changes every year. Um, so it's easy to phase out um, uh, being able to contribute to a regular deductible IRA. Um, I was talking to Aaron before, and I, I learned that the average starting salary for optometrists is around 120,000. So if you're, if you're done and working, you're probably making too much money to contribute directly to an IRA, a deductible IRA. Mm. Um, but simple needs to be employer sponsored. So you need some kind of self-employment income to be able to do that. Right. Okay. And let's see here. Okay. So this is from an, another anonymous member. Uh, what is the best way for an S corp to distribute dividends? Except, and uh, they also ask during the end of the year, and then also to reduce tax liability. Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of things in that question I'd want to clear up first. Mm -hmm. um, the term dividend has a specific definition when we're talking taxes, and it, it means a payment out of the earnings and profits of a C corporation. So dividends by definition are taxable payments to the shareholder of a corporation. So unless the S corporation has um, used to be a C corporation, the, the term, there won't be any dividends. So the, the term that we would, that we use in the code uses is distributions. Sometimes people call it laws. Yeah, I think that's what they're trying to go for. Yeah, yeah. So just to clear that up, so there's no confusion with everyone else out there. So, um, and it really doesn't matter how much you distribute or don't distribute out. You're still going to be taxed on the profit of the company. So, like if you're if you have an S corporation that earns a million dollars, and you don't take out any money during the year, you're going to pay taxes on the million dollars that it earned. And that's the very that's the hallmark of pass through taxation is that it's not tied to the any any payments you receive. It's just whatever the the profit loss says at the bottom more or less is what you're going to be taxed on. And so, um, yeah, so it doesn't really, doesn't really make a difference, I guess. Okay. And how does profit sharing work for owners and staff? Yeah. So I'm assuming that this is profit sharing in the case of a 401k plan. That's what I'm imagining this would yeah. be. For. Yeah. Uh, so, so profit sharing, if the term's a little misleading, what it really is, is it's, it's, it's a component of a 401k plan where the business contributes to each employee's account a certain percentage of their compensation. And so it can be as high as 25% of compensation. So like there are basically three ways to get money into a 401k. So you defer money from your paycheck and it goes into the account. There's a match that the employer makes as a percentage up to a certain percentage of your total compensation. And then the third one is this profit sharing where it's a percentage of your compensation. So like, so if you're a practice owner, and um, you're, let's say you're an S corporation and you're taking a salary of 175. Um, well, you run into a cap if you do that. So let's say you're taking a salary of, of 100,000. Mm -hmm. And so you do a profit sharing of 25% for everybody, you're gonna get a, a $25,000 profit sharing contribution to your 401k in addition to hopefully the deferral that you made and then any matching contribution that's available. So that's that's a real good that's a really beneficial component to have of a 401k. 
Mm-hmm. But if you have other employ- if you have employees, it can it can get expensive for you as a practice owner to have that because then you're putting more money into their plan. And maybe maybe that's part of what you want to do to encourage people to stay and as just additional compensation. Right. But it's also a really good way to save a lot for your own retirement. Yeah, makes sense. All right, we got two questions from uh, Two Ann again. Uh, first question, is it advantageous to add a family member to the payroll, pros and cons of that? And then the other question is, how long do we keep tax records and receipts for? Okay. So as far as adding family members, so if you are a parent and you have uh, children that are under 18 uh, and you add them on the payroll for work that they actually do and you're paying them a reasonable rate for what they're actually doing, um, that can be a really good tax strategy because you get a deduction for that. And if you pay them less than the standard deduction, then they're not going to be taxed on that income. And so they could potentially use that to open up a Roth IRA. Um, that's a real common strategy. If, if you're operating as a sole proprietor, you, don't, you won't have any payroll taxes on the wages you pay to them. If you're operating as an S corporation, you do have to pay payroll taxes on the wages you pay to them. But uh, given you know that they won't be taxed on it and that you're not being taxed on it, and then any tax savings on the growth of that Roth IRA money can be a pretty good deal. Uh, to do that. The the catch is that you can't pay them more than is reasonable for what they're doing. You can't have a kid file for one hour a week and pay them 12 grand. Like that doesn't really make sense. So yeah, that's kind of that's a boring biased. joke on our group for a while that, you know, okay. had your kid clean the bathroom or post for some photos on an Instagram uh-huh. shoot and yeah, game really 20K. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. Yeah. So that's be a reasonable amount, which makes sense. Yeah. There was and, a second I forgot what that was. Yeah. Second question was how long do we have to keep tax oh, records yeah. and receipts for? Yeah. So there's not like a hard answer for this one. So I usually just talk about the statute of limitations. Mm-hmm. So the normal statute of limitations, that's where the IRS could come audit you and have you pay more tax. Um, that's three years from when you file the return of the due date of the return, whichever is later. And, and so I'd say at least three years. And then, um, you know, I usually go a few years beyond that just to just to be sure there can be a longer statute in some cases like if you don't report more than 25 percent of your income or you commit tax fraud like there's no statute for the tax fraud and a six-year statute for the other case but um that's a very few small group of people that are doing that but uh yeah so i'd say at least at least several years like i i just i save everything digitally and i don't ever go back and delete what i have i just save it all anyway because it's all electronic and it's not really taking up too much space yeah makes sense all right, let's see here. Uh, another question from a member. Um, question for the CPA, wondering if you could touch upon continuing education write-offs for sole proprietors. What is covered? And an examples are international education travel versus domestic travel, meals, planes, trains, automobiles, hotels, etc. What write-offs are we allowed? Okay. Um, if your trip is exclusively to go do continuing education somewhere, like there's, um, it's going to be fully deductible. So the cost of getting there, the cost of meals while you're while you're there, can't wait. Only 50% of the meals while you're there will be deductible. Um, so hotels, all that. That I think the the tricky part is sometimes is these get paired with like you might stay another week and go um, go have fun, and even the conference might be like one day. So if it gets to be where you know, the conference is one day and you're there for 10 days, like you're only going to deduct a portion of your airfare and then there are probably like a one day of your hotel stay, whatever's related to business. But if it's all business, then you can deduct the whole thing. Okay. And that counts for like Uber rides as well. And yeah, any, anything while you're there, any travel expenses, anything like that. Okay. All right. And we covered, yeah, we covered the gifts. Uh, the, it's kind of a follow-up question from another member. Uh, what's the best way to gift money to staff? Uh, yeah, so, here? yeah, so when I hear gift, I hear like not a business expense. So maybe, mm-hmm. maybe they, um, so if you're, not, if you're not saying it's a business expense, you're just giving it to them as an individual, like mm-hmm. there's no issue with that. I think if, if you want to claim it as a deduction, then you're, then you're basically saying like this is a form of compensation to them. There's some exclusions for like, length of service awards, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think that really apply here. But if I'd say if it's like 
going back to that we mentioned earlier, the twenty five dollars per per like per person is, can be a deductible business gift. I say if you keep it small, dollar amounts like that, I wouldn't have any problem deducting that and then not like putting it on a W two. Um, if you're you know giving them fifteen hundred dollars and trying to say it's a business expense, like you should probably uh, be treating that as compensation if you want to deduct it. But if you don't want to deduct it, just you know give to your heart's content and it's just going to be a gift. Okay. All right. And then, um, yeah, a question from uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, what is your preferred method for reducing tax liability? And then she writes that I have been mostly increasing 401k contributions, but I was wondering if putting more into an HSA or other method would be better. Oh, I see. Yeah, so retirement plans is the big one that I look at with my clients. And then, um, and then HSA, if they have a high deductible health plan, I recommend fully funding that every year. And then um, if you can, not taking the money out as you have medical expenses, just letting it grow in there. It can be almost like a like a backup retirement account mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and the strategy with that is you like save all your receipts for your uh, medical expenses along the way. And then when you retire, you can take it out tax free to the extent you've had all those prior medical expenses. And then once you're retirement age, even if you don't have medical expenses, you can take it out, but it's subject to income tax, but not any penalties. So it's functions just like a regular retirement account at that point. Um, the other method I like is um, the backdoor Roth. I think I've seen some posts about it on the site, on the Facebook group, but um, yeah, basically what, what it is, is you, if you make too much money to contribute to a uh, Roth IRA directly, you can make a non-deductible contribution to a regular IRA and then immediately roll the money over into the Roth. Um, and that's a great way to get money in that's going to have tax-free growth. And the catch is you can't have any other IRA money uh, when in the year at the end of the year that you do the rollover uh, because there's some pro rata rules that would make some of that rollover taxable. And so a real common strategy is to have a 401k, roll any IRA money into it, and then that enables you to do the backdoor Roth. And so max out the 401k, max out the HSA, and then do the backdoor Roth every year. You can put quite a bit of money away. Depending yeah, on that's a, a fair amount with all the maxes. Yeah. And can you touch on the the mega backdoor? Or I've yeah. Heard of that. Um, yeah, I know it's like a, a point of contention with a lot of conversations. So. Oh, really? What's the, what's the contention about it? Uh, there's just some argument on how to do it properly. and. All right. Well, I know I spent some time researching on my own, and then I spoke with another expert to, just to make sure I understood it right. So mm -hmm. I feel like I have the, the right answer on how much you can put in and how to, how to do it. So so basically, so like I said earlier, when you put money into 401k, you, you do money as a deferral out of your salary, and that can be either pre-tax or Roth. So that's not what we're talking about here. So I, I think you're clear on that. Mm -hmm. And that, and then there's whatever your employer puts in, but then there's still like a total amount that you can put into your 401k. And this year it's up to 56,000. But there's another constraint, which is your total um, income um, from it. So like a, a, com a common scenario I see is someone will, be, will have a main job, they'll earn you know, whatever they earn and they'll, they'll have a 401k and they'll do the salary deferral on that 401k plan. And they might earn $50,000 on the side um, as, as a contractor and have a solo 401k. And so with the 50,000, they, they could do, they can only do the profit sharing contribution, um, which is going to be about, what is that? 10 grand. Yeah. So that's about 10 grand that they can put in pre-tax. And there's a self-employment, there's a one half of self-employment tax that I'm ignoring for this calculation. Um, but they're going to put in about 10 grand as a pre-tax. And um, and without without this mega backdoor Roth feature, um, that would be all that they could put in. And that's all that they can make as a deductible contribution. But if their 401k plan allows two features, uh, in-service withdrawals and after-tax contributions, they could put in more money. And so what the after-tax contribution is, is the employer, the employee, or just this, this person in my example, can, can put in an additional um, forty thousand dollars into their four hundred one k, and it's it's not deductible, but they can just put it in as an after tax contribution. And so the constraint in this case is the um, the fifty thousand dollars of income that they have, um, and so they could put the forty thousand in, and then they are able to roll it out into a Roth IRA, and that's the in service withdrawal piece. And because and you're able to segregate it, there's no like pro rata rule that gets applied. There's a 
revenue notice from 2014 that, that spells this out that there's no pro rata rules apply in this case. And so you can have pre-tax contributions and roll it out. So that's good for people who are maxing out pre-tax space or their marginal rate isn't high enough to want to do more uh, pre-tax, but they would prefer to do post-tax. And then so then you would roll it out um, and be able to do that. And then, like the, you need a special kind of plan to do it. And so the ones that I've seen usually charge uh, three or $400 a year, two or $300 a year to have this special plan document in place that allows this. Okay. That's a good way to clear it up, yeah. All right, and then one other question. I think this was a good one, actually. Uh, this was from our member, Dr. Jadine. Uh, as a potential buy-in and sitting down with the practice's current CPA, could you recommend the most important information to take away uh, to get the best practice metrics, I guess, before buying a practice? Oh, yeah. So is this buying into an existing practice, or is this like you're taking it over completely? Buying a practice in whole is from that's what I'm getting from this question. Okay. Um, and she just wants the CPA's take on what what the best things are to look for. Yeah. So I read. Yeah, I read it. So like, if you're buying into a practice, that's how I read it initially. Um, yeah. Or either way. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about both. So if you're buying into an existing practice and you're going to be like an owner, um, the things I would make sure to understand, like how exactly you can be compensated, how is that determined? So it's all spelled out ahead of time how and when are distributions gonna be made? Like, how are you actually gonna get money out? Like besides maybe your normal base compensation? Um, what do you expect things to be like in the future? Is it growing, is it not growing? Um, and then when you do wanna exit, how are you gonna be bought out? Uh, so I guess those, some of those would carry over if you're buying a solo practice. Um, I'd look at look at cash flow. Um, see, like, is it, is it, like, what's the cash flow like? Is it, is it is, um, is there a lot tied up in receivables or like how is how is that working? Um, that's that's probably the biggest thing that I I look at and then to see um, like where the new business is coming from and that kind of thing. Okay. And actually, one question I got actually actually after I sent you all these questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, just in general, for an associate optometrist and then for an owner, uh, what would be like your biggest three tax tips? First for the associate, the one that's employed, okay. and then for the owner. Yeah, so for the employed one, I'd make sure that you are taking full advantage of every benefit you have available um, to you. So like fully participating in the 401k, um, making sure you get, you, if you have anything out of pocket that you can get reimbursed for anything that you possibly can, mm -hmm. get anything that's available. And then the next thing is like, make sure you get your withholdings dialed in uh, through your job. So I don't know, like, is it is it common to also do, as an associate to also do some side work? Like where you, or do you just normally a full-time employee? Uh, from what I've, yeah, from colleagues that are associates, a lot of them, yeah, do do side work and Okay. Some IC work, but yeah. Yeah. So if you have side work going on and like that's like 1099 income, mm -hmm. like the best thing to do is to adjust your withholding at your main job to pay the taxes that are going to be due on the contract work as well. Okay. So they have to make estimated payments, potentially minimize any estimated tax penalties. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think that's the big things there. And then and uh, for owners. Yeah. Yeah. For owners, I'd say look at, um, I'd say look at um, getting the best type of retirement plan that you can get. Cause that's like, that's the biggest tool you have to reduce your taxable income is, um, is retirement accounts. And so if you have employees, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to, to really max it out than if it was just you. Uh, but I'd make that a priority, finding the best type of plan, whether it's a 401k or a simple IRA um, and coming up with a strategy of how you're going to get the most amount of money away um, pre-tax. And then, um, I, one thing that I like to do with all my clients is, is I do a marginal tax rate analysis. And I actually see like on every $5,000 of pre-tax contributions to a retirement plan, what's the actual marginal tax rate on that? How much is what, as a percentage of what you put in, how much is it reducing your taxes? And depending on how much income you're at, that, that can vary a lot. Cause like with the qualified business income deduction, it actually takes away some of the benefit of making, um, pre-tax retirement contributions, but in some cases it actually can um, amplify the pre-tax. It can inc increase the qualified business income deduction if you're in the phase-out range. So there's some complexity there to plan for. So if you're 
at the right range, you might only be getting like 19.2% um, federal uh, marginal tax rate on your retirement contributions. And then you might want to think about like, should I be doing Roth at that point? Like what do I expect to be um, at in my retirement? Mm -hmm. um, so getting, getting that dialed in, because that's something that once you get set up and have execute year after year, that can create a lot of value for you. So you get it done the right way. Okay. And then, yeah, one other question. Any tax pitfalls? Uh, the yeah. I think the biggest thing them. is going from being an employee to being self-employed. The big shift is having to make estimated payments or, or being more responsible for how much you're paying in during the year. It kind of happened automatically for you as an employee. And it's really easy to get behind it and not set aside enough. And you suddenly you get a $20,000 tax bill. And then and then you're tr struggling to catch up with that while you need to pay the current year's estimated taxes. So it can create this like multi-year cycle where it's hard to get out of it. So I think the biggest thing is be super proactive about paying enough in during the year. Like, And it's, it's going to hurt a little bit because you're not used to having to like write checks and do that kind of thing to the government. But get, get in that mode and stay on top of it. Okay. And then we got a comment from uh, Satish. I think the mega backdoor Roth question is about practice owners with employee participants doing mega backdoor Roth through their office 401k, not the solo 401k route. Oh yeah, so it, it would be the same. Okay. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. You, you can have like if you have employees, um, you can you can allow them to be able to do it as well. I'm I don't I'm not aware of any differences that would happen if you had other participants besides yourself. And the plan, like they, they could also do it. I think that a fair number, I saw a study on, online, I think a, a pretty large percentage of plans allowed you to be able to do this, uh, okay. but it's really not a standard feature, but. Right. Cool. Well, I think that's all the questions that I have and all the ones that are on the live feed at this point. Okay. Is there anything else you want to add? Anything that we didn't talk about? That... Uh, no, I think we got a pretty good, get pretty good coverage of things. Okay, great. Yeah. And then I want to tell all the users. So David Glenn, he is a sponsor of our website and he has vetted both that and I vet all our sponsors. We only let certain people on the website, people that we trust and people that we know will do a good job. So he is on there. Uh, he's on the side banner. So if you're looking for a CPA, definitely a good option. He's in Hawaii. So uh, I don't know, maybe you can fly out there and get some sort of yeah. deduction on uh, your trip yeah. out to see him. But yeah, we, we vetted him. Great guy. Definitely okay. recommend him if you're if you're looking for a CPA. And okay. anything else you want to expand on in, in terms of your business and how you run uh, it and all that? I'm looking to grow. I'm um, you know focused on um, on doctors and and helping them out and and being really focused on that and doing a high level of service. A lot of um, people will. A lot of CPAs aren't aren't very proactive or they're really reactive. Like you'll see them once a year. So my business model is to be really proactive with new clients and setting up the best tax plan for them. And then, um, you know, talking to them once or at least, at least once in the fall to check in on things and then being available year round as, as things change and to answer questions. So it's more of a full service business model than, than a transactional once a year. So a lot of people look for that and appreciate that. Um, in CPA, um, and it's not as common as I think it should be. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. Yeah. And Satish has one more question, uh, I think, still regarding the uh, mega backdoor. He says, yeah. my understanding is it fails the testing. What do you think of it? You know, I don't I don't know the answer to that piece. <laughs> I've never heard of it being a problem with, with groups. But, you know, once it gets into that testing and things, that's a little outside of my expertise um, to do. So most of the time I'm I'm doing these it is with solo plans and I've, things I've seen um, and read. Um, to do with, with multi-participant 401k plans. I haven't seen a problem with it, but it could be, that could be true. I just don't know for sure. Okay. And then how can uh, members contact you and yeah, email, so, uh, phone, yeah. all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have, my website is taxcpaforddoctors.com. Um, and so the name of my firm is Glenn Advisory. Uh, so I just do tax work and I help with payroll and bookkeeping if needed, but I don't do financial planning or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so go check it out. There's my site that you can learn all about what I do and. Um, and how I work. And if you want to schedule a call with me, I have a, uh, I use Calendly to schedule a phone call so you can schedule one pretty easy. We can find some times or just email me to ask me any questions about uh, things you have. And um, I will often look at like your last year's tax returns to see if there's anything I can improve on just, just as a free check. Uh, a lot of times I can find things to do differently for people and uh, from doing that. So. Awesome. Yeah. And then once again, yeah, David's 
info is going to be on our website on the side banner and we'll also put you on the banner on our facebook right, group as you. well and yeah and you're in the group as well so if people do post tax questions I, th I think you answered one of them one time yeah so. I, kinda, I check on it periodically and see yeah that. yeah so he'll be answering so if you see his name you know that it's the expert answering so yeah all right anything else you want to say before we no i think i'm good thanks for your time and it's just been enjoyable yeah well thanks for coming on the broadcast and Enjoy that sunlight that's still out. I will, yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.